Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Microsoft Flight Simulator. And today, following the release of my uh, ATR 72600 tutorials guide, we're going to be doing a full flight in the ATR going from uh, Orlando up to Atlanta, Georgia. Pretty quick flight, guys. I'm going to skip a lot of the cruise and everything like that. Just keep it step by step performance and uh, hopefully show you guys how to fly the ATR in a way that makes it fun for you guys. If you are interested in acquiring any of my Overkill's tutorial guides for Microsoft Flight Simulator or simply interested in supporting the channel, please consider joining us on Patreon. Patreon subscribers level tier two and above have access to all of my guides, as well as any future releases that come down the road. Patreon link can be found in the description below. So again, you guys, this is the guide that we are going to be walking through here today. As you guys can see, it has absolutely everything that you need to learn the ATR 72600 and enjoy your flights around Microsoft Flight Simulator. So if you guys are interested, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Uh, that's where all of my guides reside. You guys will have access to all of them by subscribing tier two and above. All right, let's jump right into this bad boy. So the first thing we're gonna do is step on down to our EFB. The EFB can be a little buggy, so I'm gonna give you guys a couple of tips while we're here too. So obviously we wanna import our uh, flight plan, set your fuel, set your payload, set your aircraft exteriors, right? Doors, tail prop, all that good jazz, and then do nothing else with this, okay? Um, what I have found to be the leading culprit uh, to the EFB freezing is that button right there, load aircraft. Stay away from it. I have found that to be the number one thing that causes my EFB to freeze and sometimes the rest of the aircraft. Um, I will still be able to use my cameras and things like that, but like any trying to manipulate any controls I have found get weird and all seems to be revolving around the EFB. And the EFB, again, I've had the worst experience uh, when I use that load aircraft button. So we're going to do it a different way. But we do want to take note of these numbers here as we'll be using them later on. So let's go ahead and get moving here. So we're going to zip right through this guy. Let me get up to the start of our uh, pre-flight checklist here. And here we go. All right. So let me actually make that a bit smaller here. There we go. That works. I think what I'll do is move this over here. I know you guys can't see what I'm doing, but I promise I'm doing things, moving windows around to make it a bit easier to navigate through this guy. Okay, so let the games begin now. So first thing we're gonna do is we would check that all circuit breakers are in and uh, closed. Now that's not exactly modeled in this current issue, but um, we have the parking brake is set. Throttle levers are set at idle. Condition levers are uh, at fuel shutoff. Park or uh, gust lock is set. Flaps are retracted. Landing gear handle is down. EFB, we already turned on the ground power. Made sure that the tail pop, tail prop, and any necessary doors are open. Let's move up to the overhead panel. Wipers are all shut off. Let's go ahead and flip the battery on. Monitor the uh, multifunction computer displays and make sure that the fault lights extinguish landing gear lights show as on emergency ESS bus should be illuminated, but the standby or uh, under voltage light should not uh, be on. Let's go ahead and turn the nav lights on for now. Let people know, Hey, we're here. Step downstairs for a second. Let's go ahead and clear the master caution and we will also flip on external power coming upstairs. And there it is. External power is now live. While the rest of the systems are coming on, like our displays and things like that, we'll clear the overhead panel of anything that we need to turn on. So we want all white lights extinguished except for uh, the uh, pedo heaters. So we're going to turn on our hydraulic pumps. So it's going to be blue pump, auxiliary pump, grain side. Turn our main oxygen on. The windshield heaters need to get turned on here. And we should have another master caution that needs to be cleared. Let's step down. There it is. Boop. Okay, master caution is now off. Now we're going to go ahead and pressurize the green side. If we move to our hydraulics page, assuming that I click the right button, that would be probably pretty helpful too. I don't know how I feel still about using these click spots. Yeah, I really don't. Uh, let's come on down here and we're going to go to the systems page. There we go. Okay. So let's go ahead and pressurize our system here. So if we hit the auxiliary or hydraulic auxiliary pump, this pump will only run for 30 seconds but we depress it, you can see that the auxiliary and blue side, um, or excuse me, the auxiliary side is pressurized. Gosh, I can't talk. Now we're gonna go upstairs, turn the cross feed on, and that will pressurize the green side. Now I'm gonna press that button again because I did quite a bit of talking. Let's 
go upstairs, turn on the crossfeed. You can now see that both sides are now pressurized. Always good stuff. We're gonna turn the crossfeed back off now that we've pressurized the green system as well. Any external lights, nav or uh, wing lights, logo lights, etc., things like that. Emergency exit lights you wanna make sure are armed. Now we did fuel the aircraft here. So at this point, if you wanted to, you could turn the seat belt signs on, but we'll be back for that later. We're gonna test the enunciation lights, make sure everything is illuminated as uh, desired. No dead lights, all that good jazz. Okay, and then we'll switch it back down to bright for day operations. Let's do a quick test of the fuel pump system here and as well as activate the fuel pumps. We're gonna turn on the left pump, make sure that the uh, left low feed uh, pressure light turns off. Then we're gonna turn on the cross feed, make sure the right low feed pressure light turns off so we know the left pump is handling both sides just fine. Turn the cross feed back on, turn the right pump on, make sure it goes to run and make sure that we also once again get an extinguished low pressure feed light on. Okay, coming upstairs, make sure all door lights are working as necessary. Test the cabin and service lights as if they were closed, is what that simulates. Landing gears still indicating three green. We want to make sure that the flight control system is set to auto. Do a squib test on the engine one fire system. Do a fault test. Make sure the fault lights illuminate. You'll also get illuminations down here on the um, the loop one and loop uh, loop one B, loop one A um, are for the fire system that we're messing with right now. If we go up top, do a fire test. Again, you can see the alerts here also showing on the engine display page. Okay, fire test working just fine. All right, and now let's go ahead and set the aircraft up for hotel mode. What hotel mode is, is essentially it will run engine number two, but doesn't actually spin the prop. Now to do that, again, we need to pressurize the hydraulic system so that way we can activate the prop lock. So we're gonna turn on our hydraulic auxiliary pump once again. You can see the ready light comes up on the prop brake. Open the cover, or the cover, turn the switch on to prop brake, and shut it down. Okay, or close it down, excuse me. And now the aircraft is now ready for hotel mode if we are ready to activate that now. Make sure that you don't have any white lights on the electronic system. We would test the cockpit voice recorder, although it's not currently modeled at this time. We shouldn't have any fault lights except for DC Gen 1 and DC Gen 2. Sorry, that's reversed. Obviously, reason being because the engines are not currently running, so you're obviously not going to get any generation out of them. All right, and at this point, we'll come back to the bottom. Uh, no device lights. No seatbelt or uh, the seatbelt signs get turned on. De-icing panel and anti-icing panel should be as shown here, but... You know, unless you're in icing conditions, you wouldn't turn any of these on. If you are in icing conditions, then obviously you would need to look at the respective surfaces uh, in order to turn those on. And the only fault light that you should see here is the aircraft uh, airframe fault light. Again, we don't have any electrical power running to those particular systems, so the fault light should be on. Okay, lots to talk about. I'm trying to get through this quickly, so forgive me if I sound like I'm getting winded. Probe heaters all remain off until just before engine start, so we're going to leave those as is. AC wild electric power. This is actually used primarily by maintenance or ground power or when the aircraft is under tow. You should never be turning this on. Like, in for simulation purposes, we have no reason to ever turn on the AC wild electric or external power. Uh, that is different from just your standard external power here. Again, this is primarily just used by maintenance, so you really shouldn't ever have to mess with this panel. Obviously, the hydraulic power, we've already discussed that, but this is exactly how the panel should reflect. We don't have anything running from engine one and engine two, which is why we have the low pressure on the uh, blue and uh, green pump system. Blue is essentially your left side, green is your right side. On the emergency locator transmitter, you have absolutely no way to effectively test this, even in the real aircraft, as sending a quote-unquote test will actually send a live distress signal using the emergency locator transmitter, which could be bad, because then you get search and rescue coming and looking for you guys. Okay, right um, windshield wiper still set to off. Nunciator test lights we already did. Obviously, packs and air bleed system, you're going to have fault lights. We don't have the engines running. Um, pack and uh, avionic system, we do want to check the smoke test. So we're going to do a quick smoke test. And again, if you come down to, this is for the avionic system. You're going to see forward smoke, aft smoke, electrical smoke. Okay, so this is your smoke test system. If we come upstairs to resolve it, though, however... What you're going to do to resolve it is depress the exhaust mode once and depress it again to reset it. 
I don't know how well you guys can see that, but the button actually remains depressed after the first time. So you have to press it again to actually reset the system. Squib test on engine two. Fault test engine two, fire system. And fire test engine two. There you go. And that wraps everything up for the overhead panel at this time. Clear any master cautions. Let's keep on going. Now we're gonna test the prop system. So we're gonna step all the way to the back and what this is essentially going to be is testing the system is behaving correctly in the event of an engine loss is what we're gonna be testing for now. So we're gonna open the um, automatic takeoff power control system cover. Now, if you just leave it open, it will close automatically on its own. So you have to do this part kind of fast. So we're first, we're gonna to go to the arm. Oop, let's go to engine one, arm position. You can see there's an arm light up there on the uh, enunciator. Again, that is the automatic takeoff power control enunciator system, which is why, uh, which is up here and you have engine one and engine two or electronic engine control system, I think is what that panel is. Then we're gonna go over here to the test and this is where we start seeing some magic happening. So you'll see that engine one shows no torque. Engine two is going to compensate. Engine one is going to show it's re retracting to auto feather and then obviously you get all of your enunciator lights. Now we will only complete that test once. I won't make you guys go through this again because I'm sure the beeping is absolutely obnoxious, but you would repeat the process for the second engine and make sure everything works. So good times, right? <clears throat> Set your floodlights as desired. The ATR does get a little dark in here. So if you want to turn that on, even during the day, it actually does help out quite a bit. At this point, you would make sure that all of your trim systems work. I'm not gonna actually go through this to save time in the video, but essentially you take your trim systems and run them from one side to the other side. Make them make sure that they have full control and full authority over the uh, respective surfaces. Set your FS and um, EIS up to your desire. Right now we're gonna return it to the flight plan page. Come over here, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Set your radios up as desired as well. And we're gonna come back to here. And we wanna make sure that your idle gate is pulled. You wanna make sure that your audio cancellation switch is guarded and on. Whoa, that was weird. Not sure what happened there. Okay, I think we're still good. My computer like wigged out there for a second. That was odd. Anyway, so now we're going to come up and make sure that as we checked earlier that the gust lock is enabled, flaps are retracted. Moving forward, go to your navigation. Here, you would set any of your nav radios and frequencies as desired. Okay, that was kind of odd. I'm not sure my computer kind of wigged out there for a second. So now we're going to Hang on a second, something else wigged out here. One of my monitors turned off behind me and I'm not sure what happened, but it screwed all my buttons up. There we go. So now we're gonna turn it over to the nav display. We're gonna go to surveillance mode here. We're gonna set our transponder code, simulating that we've got our clearance, three, five, six, two, and eventually I'll be doing some beyond ATC in the ATR. So stick around for that, that'll be fun. We want the transponder in standby. Let's go ahead and go to the TCAS. We wanna make sure it's set to auto, which is good. We can turn that back to nav, set our TCAS to above. This is because we are going to be climbing, obviously coming off takeoff. When it comes time to the descent, we'll set this down to below. And that is basically it for the moment. So let's continue moving on. We can test the weather radar. So we're gonna turn this over to test, which is the far right position. We are on the wrong display for it, so give me a second. Come on, there we go. So now as long as you get the nice pretty little rainbows here, it means the radar weather system is working just fine, or weather radar system. We're gonna move that to standby. And we also wanna set the tilt to plus five degrees. If not, you'll be staring at the ground. All right, so that's the weather radar in place. Now, if all of this was modeled, we would then check the stick pusher shaker, basically making sure that the shaker works in the event of a stall. We'd make sure that the APM or aircraft performance monitor alerts are working just fine. So basically we would depress this and make sure that it simulates the alerts and faults of an aircraft system. 
Boost should be off in our particular use. You would really only use boost in an emergency situation where you have very, very short field takeoff or something to the effect where you had to use that. And propeller electronic console system um, or uh, PEC, as it is called, there we go, are showing no fault lights. And power management switch should be set to takeoff. It's weird because like when I'm reading through the guide, you know, I've spent so much time writing it that now it's like I I have to read everything step by step or I know I'll get ahead of myself. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm going page by page with you guys. That's why you keep hearing me sort of talking and then slowing down for a second. So I do apologize. OK, the integrated electronic standby instrument system. We want to make sure there aren't any flags there. All surface trims are set to a neutral. Flaps, as we determined, are in the retracted position verified over here on the engine display page. Total air temperature, or excuse me, true air temperature and static air temperature should be the same down here. And then the fuel used should both show zero. So notice they show 320. We need to change that. How we're going to do that is we're going to come down here to our MFD display page, go to the performers page. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of the click spots. And right here where it says reset fuel used, click that. You can see they both move to the zero position. So cakewalk. Landing elevation. Now, unfortunately, this is not modeled as of yet. Uh, even in manual mode, I have not been able to make this work. I've seen a couple people who have been able to, or a couple videos where manual mode worked. But for me, no matter what I do, it doesn't work. So we just leave it as inoperable at this time. Pressurization system, which is right up here again. We would make sure that there aren't any fault lights or anything like that. No dump switches are active. The mode should be set to or uh, automatic without any fault light indicating. And the anti-skid should be on with landing gear handle down. On means lights extinguished. You're good to go. All right, let's move up to the forward page of the forward cockpit here. Ground proximity warning system. Terrain awareness. Test. Start. Terrain awareness. System. Test. Check your compass. Terrain awareness. Test complete. Make sure on the flight guidance control panel or autopilot panel, if you will, uh, that your navigation source selectors are set to FMS. Captain side should be FMS one. Uh, first officer side should be FMS two. Couple side of whoever is flying. So in our case, we're gonna be flying from the captain's seat. We wanna make sure that's set to the left side here. Make sure we are good to go. Now, we can also walk through a different other, a few other tests, such as testing the oxygen system, making sure electronic panels, electronical, nice. Electronic panels are set as desired, um, but I'm going to skip that portion, just sort of speed things up for you guys a little bit, as there isn't any actual activity that we can do. However, we will open the communications door, as that door remains open uh, for all of our documentation, everything that we need from the ground crew and our uh, um, company, until we start the left engine. Right about left engine start, we'll need to make sure that door is closed as uh, we don't want anything being too loud and annoying. Okay, at this point would be a good time to set all of your radio comms. So if you want to set any of your radio frequencies, now would be a good time. You can do that by just clicking on the independent screens and then edit them here and hit enter. Um, I'm not worried about any radio communication today as we are not using any live ATC. Barometric pressure, you can use your barrel knob here or just do what I'm gonna do and cheat today and use the B key on the keyboard to set our barometric pressure on both uh, altimeters. We've already reset the fuel used. Verify that that is still showing zero, it is indeed. Stepping on down, let's begin our programming of the FMC. So we're gonna come into the FMC here. We're gonna go to initialization after we verify that configuration and nav data both state okay. So we're gonna go to initialization. We're gonna start with the weight page. And this is where I told you guys that we needed to monitor this page here. We're gonna be looking at two. Fuel uh, on board, which is ramp fuel. This is total fuel on board, 5,004 pounds. And we're also gonna to want to be looking at zero fuel weight. So let's go ahead and start down here again. So we know that we have 5,004 pounds of fuel on board. And let's go up and get that gross weight again, or zero fuel weight, 43862. 43862. Boom. And make sure that your weights do show here. Fuel on board and gross weight should also show up here as well. So uh, this is a very nice way to load the aircraft and make sure you still have all the same numbers without having to worry about the EFB freezing. Like I said, this seems to work out just fine. I haven't had the EFB freeze 
since I started doing it like this. So I think that I really think that load aircraft is a big culprit to why that was happening. Okay, move back to the display page. Let's come on down here. Oop, there we go. Let's go to return performance initialization page. We need to set our cruise altitude. We're at flight level 160 today. Let's drop that up there. Our alternate is KHMZ and going to flight level 180 if we have to divert. Okay, got that nice and set. Easy peasy, flight plan initialization page. Let's go to our route. We are flight ATR 2598 today. Just sort of made something up. And we are going from KM Charlie Oscar to Atlanta. Drop that in, boom. Come on. It does take a minute for this part, that's normal. Hit execute and let the games begin. So we're gonna go from KMCO, we're gonna be departing on runway 18 right. We're going to be using the Red Sox one departure, the Jeffries transition, go ahead and hit execute. Next from Jeffries, we're gonna be flying direct to Amory. So we're gonna select Jeffries. We're gonna type in our next waypoint. Drop that in there and come on down. Then from Amory, we're gonna be jumping onto an airway. So selecting airways after selecting Amory, then select the Quebec 110, select our exit point as Don, and hit execute. Returning to the previous page, let's verify that all that information is as desired. So first we have Red Sox going to Jeffries, Jeffries going to Amory, Amory jumping on the Quebec 10, exiting at Don. So now we are ready to enter in our arrival information. We are expecting the ILS 26 right, coming in on the Gandalf 2, using the Zelo transition, using the Bjorn, or yeah, using the Bjorn, um, Bjorn transition with the Zelo via. So the initial fix, essentially. Okay, now we've completed that. Let's go ahead and get rid of any flight plan discontinuities. We're gonna leave the manuals in. These are essentially vectoring locations where ATC would normally vector us around, but I'm gonna show you guys a couple of different methods on how you can get around that and not have to worry about navigating that if you don't feel like dealing with ATC. We're gonna keep going through the next pages. Make sure that we clear any flight plan discontinuities. Remember, those are breaks in the flight plan where you will not be able to see what's going on here. So let's go ahead and do that. There we go, perfect. All right, let's go ahead and do an execute real quick. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you guys how to do the verification just like we always do. Using this rotary here, um, this is the uh, MFD page cycle, if you will. Uh, it will change the different menus based on the display that is currently up. So right now we have the flight plan display. We want to change that to the, I'll show you here. Let's go ahead and rotate that. There we go. If you come down here, you'll see it says flight plan plan page. What this does is exactly what it sounds like. It gives us the ability to step through the flight. So I'm going to sort of keep the camera just like that. We're going to use the next button and we can start navigating our way through the flight. And what we're looking for here, and we can actually decrease that range a little bit. Oh, the click spots. Oh, there it goes. There we go. As we're looking for any waypoints that are way off base, any breaks in the flight plan where the green line is broken, there is something that we're going to have to deal with right here. So notice this. This says Strider and 24,000 feet above. We have an altitude restriction. That's above our cruise altitude. So this could do a couple different things that I have found in my testing with the ATR. Number one, it could screw up VNAV. Um, I have found that on the descent, what was happening is I was passing through Bjorn, sort of playing around with different descent profiles and seeing what it could do. Uh, what I actually found happened is when it got here, the aircraft started to climb because it knew that there was a restriction. So which is fair. So we need to get rid of the restriction. So let me show you guys how to do that now. Um, remember Strider. Let's go ahead and step through the rest of the flight plan, make sure there's nothing else that we need to be aware of. And you guys can click right here. See how we have an option here, ETA speed and altitude. Right now we are on end of fuel on board and estimated time on route. So we're gonna click that and it changes the display to show um, our ETA, our speed and our altitude at that particular, al at that particular waypoint just like you guys are probably used to seeing in most of the aircraft, such as the Airbus and the uh, the Boeing. So everything else looks pretty good. Zelo, this is gonna be another one that's gonna be kind of a weird transition that I'm gonna show you guys how we're gonna handle when we get over there, because it's a manual location. So let's address Strider. Now, in order to do any kind of editing, you have to go back to the flight plan page. Notice that if we come back down here, now it just says flight plan again, it doesn't say flight plan plan. Okay, this is the page you must be on in order to do an edit. 
So now let's go back and let's find Strider. There's Strider, and you can see there's that restriction above 24,000 feet. We're going to change that to match our cruise altitude. So what we're interested here is the altitude constraint, not the altitude cross. We're interested in the constraint. And we're going to change that to 1 6,000 feet. Drop that in there, boom. And if you wanted to, you could put, for example, we could do one 6,000 below. Okay. If you wanted to make it so that we had to be below 16,000. In our case, we just want to be at or above it. So we're just going to put 16,000. Okay. And that's what that last square is about. Hit X and boom. And now when we go back, and we find Strider. There it is. You can see we no longer have that altitude constraint that would have caused us a problem later on. Okay, Cakewalk, guys. Cakewalk. This thing is so easy to use. I really love this ATR. This is actually really impressive um, of an aircraft. I've had a really good time flying it. Um, there were, There's definitely been some bugs and some issues that have been hard to, to get around, but I think I finally got everything tweaked out. Now, just like the rest of the aircraft, the engine display page has uh, quick spots. This is the obviously the alert system as well as the checklist page. You have three different click spots here on the left side. This will be select arrow up, move it down a little bit, select arrow down, notice that the highlight is moving, so there's up, there's down, and then select is down at the bottom. So let's go back up here. What we're gonna do here is we wanna clear everything through. I'm not worried about all of this stuff. This is all sort of pre-flight check. But what I'm actually interested in is the final cockpit preparation. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to hit OK. We see this page. We're going to hit clear again. Procedure complete. And now it's time to start our final cockpit preparation. OK, so now it's just a matter of really going through everything that we've already gone through. And this is just sort of your after procedures check. So we know our parking brake is set, altimeters have been set. Landing elevation we talked about earlier, unfortunately, isn't modeled in a way that we can use it just yet. Uh, but it should be automatically set by the FMS, by the way, guys. Once you put in your arrival information, the landing elevation should automatically populate with inside the computer. FMS common navigation information is set. We verified fuel quantity and fuel on board. Engine fuel used. Make sure that that's a zero. If not, remember, go to the performance page on the MFD control panel and hit reset fuel used. Engine fuel used so it has been reset. Memo panel, nothing of concern yet. Power management is set to takeoff. Procedure complete. Okay, now, purport, before, good. <laughs> Let's try that again here. So we got a couple of things to do here. Let's set our initial altitude. What we are doing is we are using the approach plate in the guide for the Red Sox one hour first. Our altitude restriction is at or below 7,000 at Blossom. So we're going to use that as our initial target altitude. So I'm going to go ahead and set our altitude to 7,000 feet. There it is. All right, let's make sure the right side service door is closed. So let's come back over here to the aircraft. We want that service door closed. We're going to get ready to start the right engine here is what's going to happen, guys. And it's going to actually be propeller rotation as well, not just hotel mode. All right, so now we're going to start working on starting the right engine in hotel mode. So what we're going to do is go to aircraft, make sure the service door is closed as obviously the exhaust and everything from that right engine is gonna go right down that side of the aircraft and we don't want anyone having to deal with that. So we're now gonna come upstairs. We're gonna select our engine start sw switch over to A, B or A and B. And we're going to make sure the right pump is still on and do a start switch. As soon as engine rotation gets to 10%, we're going to take the right condition lever and move it up to feather. Make sure all numbers read in the green. Fuel flow is good. Engine RPM is good. Check fuel pressure, temperatures, etc. At 45%, the start switch light should automatically go off. We're going to take the engine start switch, move it to start off abort, etc. And at this point here, we can disengage external power. The Gen 2 fault light will extinguish and we can now disconnect external power. <clears throat> Final pieces here. We're going to step on down to the EFB or the FMS again. Go to the performance page. 
verify your V1 speeds, go to performance initialization, move on over to weight. We do not have to enter this information again. Move over to weight and set our trim. Now there's two ways you can set the trim. You can either do it directly from the yoke here or on the EFB, this seems to not have any issue. Come over to payload and go to set trim. And you can see the trim is now set over here to 1.4 degrees up. Go back to the flight plan page. Okay, and finally, if icing conditions are present, you need to make sure any of your anti-icing is active. And at this point, we're also going to confirm the takeoff data. So we're gonna come back to the performance page on the MFD and select confirm takeoff data. When takeoff data is confirmed, you'll see that the trim section goes to a magenta coloring, indicating that that is complete. Now we're going to begin the checklist for engine or propeller rotation. So we're gonna go back to the aircraft page here and we're going to clear the tail prop, close the main door, close the cargo door and close or make sure your communication door is closed. Turn to the flight plan page. If any fuel used is registering, make sure that you do hit the fuel reset again. Since the prop is going to be started, we need to start our beacon light. Verify seatbelt signs, no device lights are on. And let's complete the before propeller rotation checklist. I had to restart because my sim crashed, so I have to clear this one first. And now we're at the before propeller rotation. CDLS or cockpit door locking system. This isn't actually modeled, but there's a switch behind the first officer seat on the wall. FMS takeoff data is confirmed. Trim access is set. Tail prop is stored. Doors are closed. Seatbelt signs are on. Beacon lights on. Procedures complete. We can now continue on with the propeller start. This part couldn't be any simpler. What we're going to do here is hit our hydraulic auxiliary pump again, come back upstairs, and reverse the procedure for the prop brake. Turn the prop brake off, close the door. We can return to the engine display page. Assuming that I find the right one, there it is. But you have everything right here that also shows engine ro propeller rotation. Once this reach, this is propeller rotation, 11.4%. We're gonna come up here and move the right condition lever to auto, which will start the right propeller. Now, coming up top, we're going to make sure that the uh, gen light is extinguished. The BTC is closed. Now, one line should be there, but the other one should extinguish. Unfortunately, that is a bug in the current system. We also need to come upstairs, make sure the TRU light is on. The TRU system is on. I hate it when it does this. I have noticed a bug where sometimes that doesn't activate right away, so we're just going to depress it and leave it and guarantee later on it will be on. Probe heaters can now come on. Also, the ACW Gen 2 fault light should also extinguish at this point. Unfortunately, it has not. Master caution is because of the hydraulic auxiliary pump. Do an anti-skid test. Set flaps 15. And the TRU, by the way, is the Transformer Rectify Unit. And then now we're going to repeat the steps for the left engine. This part, again, is easy as peasy. Make sure right fuel pump is on. Go ahead and set our start switch. And hit the start button. 10% of engine rotation. Condition lever to feather. Monitoring for 45%. There it is. And move it to the auto position. Start selector switch. Goes to the off position. All doors are closed. Bleed switches are, are extinguished. Gen 1 light fault light is off.
return to our nav page, set our initial runway heading, which is 185 degrees. Let's go the other way. Also remember, you guys, that I am using the latest beta, the Sim Update 13 beta. So I have noticed that it has caused a couple of weird oddities, but the overall performance of the aircraft has not been impacted. Or I wouldn't be doing this video. Okay, so we have our initial altitude set. We want to make sure the couple button is set to the pilot flying, which in our case is the captain's seat. We want to activate the heading mode, activate nav mode. Notice that you have heading selected, L nav is armed. Indicated airspeed, indicated airspeed set with the manual mode active and select VNAV for our climate. And you can see VNAV indicated airspeed also indicated as armed. Speed select, we want to come right over here and hit select. Go to magenta, that means FMS speed mode. And let's do the before taxi checklist. So just select before taxi. Uh, we can hit the recall quick button here. Nothing pending. So, let's see here. Cockpit communication hatch is co closed. Condition levers 1 and 2 are in auto anti-icing as required. TRU is on. Let's see if the light actually came on yet. Let's try it one more time. Not yet. Not sure what's going on there. Again, not uncommon. Started after I'd updated to the Sim Update 13 beta, so I know that that is having an impact on that. But then all of a sudden, like I said, later on it would just be on. We'll look up there and it'll be active. Anti-skid test has been performed. Flaps are set, are not set to 15. There they go. Go. And nose wheel steering is on. Nose wheel steering button is right here. Forward is the on position. Go ahead and close that. Make sure it's ready to go. All right, and before taxi checklist is complete, wheel chocks need to be removed. Let's go to the aircraft page. Remove the chocks. Next, we need to have the elapsed timers turned on. The elapsed timer button is actually on the first officer side. And that is this guy right here. So we're gonna select that. If we move over to the FMS and go to the data page, go to timers, you can see the elapsed timer since we pushed that button. Oops. All right, I'm going to release our parking brakes. Hold the wheel brakes down, do a takeoff config test. This is right down here behind the uh, flap switch. It'll illuminate up here on the engine display page, right underneath the rudder trim or rudder position indicator. You'll see takeoff config test okay. There it is. Okay, and we are good for taxi. So at this point now, we'll move over to the surveillance page real quick. Make sure our transponder is set to on. Weather radar, you can turn it on. It won't go active until there is weight off of wheels. Set it to WX, and you can see weather. And let's see here, MFD is set to either arc or rose. We're gonna use rose. And now we are ready to taxi to our runway. So we'll just release the brakes, add a little bit of power. Doesn't need much for her to get rolling. Brake check. Okay, last step. Complete the taxi checklist. Taxi lights. Oh, we do need to turn the taxi lights on. Brakes were checked. F, -A -F or flight guidance comp control computer and the enunciation system is set. And config test was completed. Let's go upstairs real quick and turn on that nose wheel light. We see we have a master caution that's alerting the generators, but I guarantee there's actually nothing wrong. As we add power, that will go away. And again, this all started with Sim Update 13 Beta. And 
don't want to hit anybody with the planes. So we're going to go a little wide here. Another little tip, you guys, I have found on occasion, the throttle will lose configuration. So if you ever run into that, go to options over here on the EFB, go to throttle setup, re-hit, just hit validate again, don't change anything, just hit validate again, then hit OK, and then move your throttle through its full range, full forward, then back to full aft, and all of a sudden it starts working again. So I have noticed that on occasion as well, so if you run into that, that is the fix to that as well. As I've stated a few times, I have noticed a few issues with the aircraft in its overall performance, but nothing seems to be game-breaking. Just like when many of the other aircraft, taxi between 20, 15 and 20 knots, just assume you don't have any obstructions or dangers or hazards, etc. And then uh, turns, obviously, right around 10 knots or below. Ground speed is indicated right here. So currently, we're about 13 knots. Alright you guys, so here we are holding short of the runway. As I told you, the TRU light came on. Now it should have came on at when we first pushed the button. I, I'm not sure what's going on. Again, Sim Update 13 Beta, that's when that changed. But it did come on. So, like I said, it is working. So we want to turn our strobe lights on, landing lights on. And let's get ready to take our runway here. Make sure our transponder is set to on. Make sure that our transponder code is set. Again, verify your MFD. And then we will set up center up for the runway. Let's also go ahead and verify our before takeoff checklist. Takeoff briefing, let's go ahead and remove the gust lock. Gust lock is removed. Transponder set, boost function as required. Airflow is norm. Cabin crew has been advised. Engine bleeds are as required. External lights are on. Lateral flight director bar is there. Rudder is centered. Procedures complete, we're ready for takeoff. All right, so let's do this here. So we can release the parking brake. And by the way, if you guys don't know what the gust lock does is it actually restricts the control surfaces of the aircraft, prevents them from moving around with the wind, making inadvertent uh, actions with the air airframe. Air crane? Air crane. All right, takeoff as always, guys, a lot of things are gonna happen. We're gonna do brakes release. We're gonna move the throttles to the notch position. Think of the notch position as sort of the auto position. Much like what we see in the Airbus, the A320, how it's got the climb, flex, etc. Notch is sort of the standard power mode, if you will, that we put everything in. And then all of those other features, climb, cruise, etc., are controlled by the power management switch down below. So, let's go ahead and rock and roll. We're going to get rolling once we pass V1 and rotate. We'll start pitching the nose up 5 degrees until we get a positive rate of climb. Uh, power setting should be at right about 90%. That would be a good indicator that you're in notch. If you're above 90%, that'll be an indicator that you're probably in maximum power, which isn't going to hurt anything in regards to our simulation, but ideally you want to be in the notch position. All right. Once we get our uh, positive rate of crime, gear comes up, nav light, L nav, we want to make sure that, that is green. Yaw damper and autopilot need to come on. Taxi takeoff light at 1,000 feet will come off. Well, really, it can come off once we actually get the gear up. But as you're only one person, that may not always be possible. Uh, flaps will be retracted when we see an F down here on the uh, speed tape. And then uh, autopilot engaged really any time that you guys are comfortable with it. But usually, again, right about 1,000 feet. Now, what I'm going to do here, we talked about the manual waypoint here. 
The manual waypoint here, this magenta, is all manual waypoint. So what I'm actually going to do is we're going to take off fly runway heading and then turn direct towards our next waypoint. And as we get close enough to it, you'll see our green line turn magenta. That means that LNAV has engaged and acquired the next waypoint. And that point is when we'll switch to autopilot. So we'll be flying manual until that line turns magenta. All right. All right. Well, that's it. Enough talk on. Let's do this. See the arm light indicate on the engine control switch or engine control panel. Make sure torque goes to about 90%. And it is engine power up here at 90. Airspeed is alive. Coming up on V1 and rotate. There it is, rotating. that left wing dip and again you got the flight directors going out here but that's not what I'm doing I'm gonna be flying straight out positive rate let's bring that gear up there's the F on the speed tape right there flaps coming up we do have an after takeoff checklist but we'll address that later on once we're stabilized Our new waypoint has turned magenta. Coming up on a thousand feet, let's turn that yaw damper on, autopilot on, nav mode. Don't sink. Yep, nose pitch down a little bit, that's Don't okay. Sink. We're gonna go to our climb position. Oh, you know what? That's what I didn't do when we reset. I forgot something. There she goes. So that was my fault, guys. Again, the sim crashed on me when we were getting ready to start after the first engine start attempt. So I had to quickly try to get everything back up and running for you guys, and I forgot to set a couple things. Thought I had everything. All right, looks like we're back in action, though. TLU low speed, that's totally fine. So engine power management, let's go ahead and go, just go through the after takeoff checklist. Landing gear is up, flaps are retracted, power management is set to climb. Engine bleed is on, taxi lights, let's turn them off. Stop. Oh. Taxi light is now off. Altimeter is set and check, procedure is complete. Oh, and my LNAV did not activate. Okay, guys, so I flew a little too long. I wasn't paying attention. Didn't have my uh, nav mode set. So what we're going to do is we're still in heading mode. I'm going to turn my heading here. Let's turn the aircraft towards our next waypoint. You ever run into this issue you just steer yourself to the next waypoint most autopilots if you're off if your next waypoint is off a certain amount of degrees anywhere from 5 to 15 degrees i've seen based on the aircraft the autopilot will not engage in nav mode or lnav so now we have lnav active but it actually still thinks that the other one was still the waypoint so we have to wait until this switches notice that it's looking for manual so we'll go to flight plan and what I'm going to do here at this point is I'm just going to clear the Red Sox or the manual waypoint. Get that out. And now you can see we've readjusted the FMS is recalculated. And what caused that is that I flew straight for too long. I wasn't paying attention. And I missed the point at which the FMS could automatically switch over. I didn't fly direct to the next waypoint long enough. So now let's go to nav mode and we should intercept the flight course. And at this point, I'm also going to increase our altitude up to our cruise. Now, based on your cruise altitude, you obviously need to watch for transition changes. We're not going to worry about transition altitude. It's transition altitude in the United States is 18,000 feet. 
and we are not going that high. We're just going to go to 16,000, so we don't have to worry about our altimeter pressure at 18,000 today. We're just going to cruise Ronald right up to 16,000. Once we get to 16,000 feet, we'll change the power management and switch to cruise. But other than that, at the moment, you guys, other than 10,000 feet turning off the landing lights, there is not much else for us to do at the moment. So I'll see you guys when we get to our cruise altitude. All right, so we are a thousand feet to go. You can tell that by the indicating blinking yellow light there, and you can also see our uh, target altitude destination up here on the MFD. So let's go ahead and see where we're at here. All of this gets pretty darn simple from up here. There really isn't a ton to do here. Now I did skip out for you guys. Uh, I held off on waiting to turn off the landing lights so you guys can see everything in action. But really isn't a whole lot to do here. Uh, we do want to make sure that we at least verify at cruise level what our uh, altimeter pressure is. So I'm just going to tap the B key. Looks like it's all still the same. Now that we're approaching our cruise, once we get at the altitude, I'll change the power management. Coming down to the FMS, you can hit the progress page and see what your top of descent time is. We're looking at one hour, 54 minutes until we reach the top of descent. Now, as we get close to the top of descent, there's going to be a couple of caveats that I'm going to want you guys to be aware of, things that will absolutely get you if you're not careful. Um, what we can also do is go to Navigraph for a minute. I'm going to use that to get our live weather information, because that's what we are using today in today's flight to get the uh, current radar information over at Atlanta. So I'm going there right now. So let's see here at Atlanta, the weather information. We got winds 2407 knots, visibility 10, temperature 33. And where's our altimeter pressure? Altimeter is 300. All right, so we can go ahead and set all of that information. We're gonna go to the performance page and we're gonna keep clicking until we see the approach page. So, altimeter 30.01. Now we're still a ways away, all this could change, but it's the interest of saving time for you guys on the video. And then our weather information, 2407 knots. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna do 240, the initial speed, seven knots, and then a zero again for gust. So if you were gusting, if it was 240, seven knots, gusting at 15, we put 15 at the end. We don't have any gust being reported, so we're just gonna drop that in there. There's our wind information. Flap speed, approach speed, flaps landing configuration, all that is golden and ready to roll. So very easy to set up your approach information. Obviously, we can also set up our nav information. So I'm going to go to the nav radios here, select the standby page, and the ILS frequency for runway 26 is going to be 110.1. Hit enter. You can see there it is there. Move it on over to the active. You can also bring up the bearing information. You can either select the bearing button right here for bearing one, or you can actually just click in the bottom left or right corner. So there's bearing two, ADF, and there's bearing one or ADF, depending on how times you click it. And then we can also set our minimums. We're at the cruise altitude, so we're going to change our power management over to cruise. We can also set our minimums, set it over to MDA. We only use decision height in uh, category two or three. So we're going to move our... Decision height to 1,190 feet. Oops, went too far. Now you can see that MDA and decision height is blinking. That's because the selector has to be the same on both first officer and captain side. So we come on the first officer side, set it to MDA, and the blinking will go away. Right. Okay, so we've got everything already set. For our, we've got a couple more things we can do as we get closer, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. now. Let's see, where are we on distance here? Oh, we're at the max. Let's go to the top. Yes, yeah, st we're still a ways away from our top of descent, guys. So everything else is set. So now we're just going to sort of hang out here until we get closer to our top of descent, and I'll catch you guys then. All right, folks, so something I wanted to give you guys all the heads up on when it comes to the top of descent. Always check your top of descent early. Now, we have the manual waypoint, but we also have qubit right here. 
Okay, and shortly after Qubit, you can see here, so we got Qubit here, this is 40 mile range, approximately, I don't know, what we call that, maybe 10, 15 miles after Qubit, is our top of descent. The reason why I point that out is because when we set that down, let's set our altitude select, notice the top of descent is moving. So we're gonna set that down to our target altitude, and look what it does. It changes as if it was the bottom of descent. So you always wanna make sure that you take good note of your top of descent first. And we're gonna set this to 5,000 feet. That's our initial target altitude. And then it actually shows you where your bottom of descent is, okay? So, and even then that's not quite right because we'll hit 5,000 feet long before we actually get to that particular location. So I'm not sure why that moves like that. It's obviously a bug, but I wanted you guys all to be aware of it. The top of descent does work as long as you do it before you change your target altitude. So take note of where it is before you change your target altitude and you should still get a pretty good top of descent. So we know that a few miles after Qubit, even at Qubit, if we wanted to play it safe, we could start our descent. Okay, so I wanted to make sure you guys all saw that ahead of time. Again, that's another bug that generated, at least for me, after Sim Update 13 Beta. All right, you guys, so now we're going to finish up the last pieces of our um, approach procedures, essentially, basically getting ready for our descent. And again, I recommend, especially when you're learning to do all of this stuff early, as it's going to greatly impact your ability to uh, easily and smoothly land the aircraft. So while we are on a relatively straight away, what we want to do is we want to set our ILF, or first we're going to center our heading bug. We're going to then go into ILS mode here. The heading mode, you can see, is automatically active when we do that. And we're going to set our runway course. Final approach course of 275 degrees for today's approach. And this will obviously be noted on your approach plate, which is also in the guide. Okay, so there's 275. Once we have that, we'll go back to FMS 1 and re-engage nav mode so the aircraft will continue down the FMS path. So real simple to do. And from here, it's just a matter of getting ready for the top of descent now. I'm going to get us ready to set the TCAS to below when it comes time for our top of descent. Not quite there just yet. A couple more minutes here. But uh, other than that, we are completely ready to roll. So I'll see you guys in just a minute. All right, since we're doing a lot of talk on, we're gonna go ahead and start this process a little early. So because there's still quite a few bugs with VNAV in this particular aircraft, that top of descent being one of them, is normally if you would enable VNAV at the time the aircraft reaches top of descent, you'll descend, right? Well, obviously that can happen because our top of descent point moved. You can even go down to the progress page and see that it actually still shows the correct distance, um, which is a help, by the way. This is still pretty helpful, um, but that uh, it doesn't exactly <laughs> work the way we want it to. Oops, I went the wrong direction. The problem with the top of descent is what it essentially does here is, well, actually, no, this doesn't really work anymore. Now that I think about it, that doesn't, that isn't right. Um, as you can see, as we're making the turn here, oh, we are in manual mode, so let's go ahead and I'm going to clear that manual. This is, again, where we would normally be vectored. I hate it when you do this plane. Oh, it's because, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong window. You won that one plane, you won that one. And let's get going to Zelo. There we go. So we're actually going to go to Zelo here now that uh, I have that set correctly. So even the top of descent point from here doesn't work. Once that top of descent point moves, it's wrong. So VNAV can't be used, essentially. The other thing that we have is that Zelo, as you guys saw earlier, we have a very tight turn here. Well, that's not going to work out very well. So what I'm actually going to do is engage heading mode. Actually, first, we're going to turn it sort of... Like, let's set us right about... Oh, there we go. 110 degrees, somewhere in there. And I'm going to lock into heading mode there. Let's sort of fly roughly parallel. I'm going to make it a little wide to make that the uh, make the turn a little bit easier. 
But anyway, since we can't use VNAV, we're going to have to use vertical speed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to manual speed. That's indicated by the blue. We're going to set it to 240 knots. And this is the standard descent profile for the ATR. 240 knots at 1500 feet per minute. So we're going to go into vertical speed and descend at 1500. Now I want to show you guys something here that's going to happen. So here it is, there's our target descent rate. Green is our current descent rate, so we're descending at 1400 feet. There's our current speed, target speed. Now, with the ATR, it doesn't have a traditional auto throttle. Okay, so um, we're going to have to manage the power levels. Now the arrow, this yellow arrow indicates that at the throttle's current power setting, the aircraft will continue to accelerate to this yellow arrow's point. But watch what happens as we continue to descend and the air gets thicker, blah, blah, blah especially if you have a tailwind, what's going to happen is eventually the aircraft's going to begin to overspeed. When the aircraft overspeeds, we're going to get a reduced speed warning, an altitude hold mode. Essentially, VNAV is going to kick in, very drastically reduce the descent rate until the aircraft slows down. So, and then you have to re-engage vertical speed mode. So I'm going to show you guys what all of this looks like here in just a second. Let's turn that heading mode a little bit. That was a little dramatic. Here we go, we're getting close to it. And it'll be right before it hits that overspeed point that we'll get locked out of vertical speed mode. And let's go ahead and set our TCAS to below. You can see the ILS is already tracking, but unfortunately it's direct distance from the aircraft, so we have to wait till we come back around. So we're approaching it. All right, reduce speed. So here's what I have to do now. I'm gonna take my throttles And pull them back. Like I said, if they don't respond, just put them all the way to full. Notice that the arrow is dropping now below where our current speed is. So we're going to adjust our power setting. And we're still a little high, so I'm going to pull it back even further. There it goes. And then once we get there, we'll re-engage vertical speed and set our descent rate back to 1,500 feet per minute. Now I'm going to really, in, you, in the entire descent, you have to watch your speed indicator. That yellow arrow starts to climb back up, you need to reduce power. So we're just going to continue doing that as we continue down through our descent. Once we passed Zelo and I feel comfortable that we're ready to turn back around, we'll go ahead and do that. And again, all this information is in the guide. We're at 12,000 feet. Since there's only one of me, I'm going to go ahead and turn the landing lights on now and the taxi takeoff lights just to save us some time later. The guide does reflect the proper times to do so. There's just a lot that's about to happen here, and I want to make sure that I can comfortably show the important stuff for you guys, which the lights really aren't the important part. Adjust our heading just a little bit more. Get us on a bit better parallel profile here. See, like now I could actually add some power in, because the aircraft's going to continue to descend based on where we... or uh, decelerate based on our current power setting. There's that yellow arrow going up. And this gets tricky, especially if you have a small throttle. So right now I'm using the Airbus TCA kit on my desk. And that definitely makes it a little tricky to get this information or get this uh, power setting just right. Because it doesn't have the throw that some of the more advanced throttles do. It doesn't have quite the same resolution. We're going to verify our barometric pressure when we're on our way down. So now we're at 3001. ILS is tracking, but it probably won't be by the time we actually make the turnaround. But if we get to 5,000 feet early, we actually have quite a few waypoints. We have Haynes at 5,000 feet, Zelo's 5,000 feet, and I thought there was another one. But at the same token, you can see right here, that's our target point at which we should reach 5,000 feet. So that'll be handy. As we start to make the turn around, we're going to slow the aircraft down to about 200 knots. We know our approach speed if we go to the performance page. Oops, that was not the performance page. Helps you hit the right button. There we go. Approach. So 112, but that's when we're fully configured. So we got a ways to go before we got to worry about that. And our airspeed's starting to climb a little bit, so I'm going to pull power off a little. Make sure we maintain our descent rate like we want. The descent rate is everything, right? Got to make sure we get at the right spot at the right time. Now as we approach our turning point here, we're just about there. I'm going to go through the descent checklist. I kind of forgot about that. 
So we had our, we checked for any errors or information that we needed to be aware of before the descent. Landing elevation, again, not currently working. We're approaching our altitude. FMS nav radios are set. Decision height MDA is high and arrival briefing was performed. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and go to normal procedures. And we're going to get the approach check checklist at least on the set. Seat belts are set. Landing lights are on. Altimeters have been set. Calp and altitude is checked. All right. And last thing is we'll go to our before landing. We're not quite there yet. So let the games begin. So at this point here, I'm going to change our heading to about 010 degrees. Gosh darn it, I hate it when I do that. Okay. We're also slowing the aircraft down to 200 knots. I've already set the manual speed. We've still got the ILS on the read here, which is good. I think I'm going to actually set us up over for due north now. This is actually a really nice range here set. And since we're still tracking the ILS, so if you ever go past it where you're no longer tracking the ILS distance, you want to make sure that you manually turn your aircraft back towards your waypoint until you capture it. Since we're still capturing, I'm going to go ahead and switch our nav source up here to ILS-1. And I'm going to speed the aircraft up because we got very slow as I was sitting here talking. This is the problem with talking through some of these tutorials is I tend to stop paying attention to what I'm doing. Notice that the course deviation line, as we start to get closer and closer, will start coming down towards the aircraft. And then as we get closer to it, the aircraft will make the turn onto the final approach course. You have your localizer indicator here. Let's go ahead and move down a little bit. Localizer indicator right here. Um, and this will start to center as we start making the turn on to the localizer course. I'm going to re-verify our barometric pressure. See, there we go. <laughs> to make sure where we belong. All right, so here's the localizer coming down. The aircraft will start the turn in just a second. And I will admit the aircraft turns a little late. Oh, crap. It also helps when you hit nav mode. If you don't hit nav mode, you're not going to get it. So you have to switch to ILS and hit nav mode. If you don't see loc up here, so it locked on the localizer. We got lucky. We didn't get too far, but now it's going to make a goofy turn. That was totally my fault. Uh, if you don't see localizer up here, even if you see localizer blue, that means it's armed, but that means that it won't actually track. So that's one of those things that I was telling you about. If you expire the distance, if we get too far and you no longer see a distance on the ILS, Switching to the ILS localizer and hitting nav, the aircraft will continue to fly straight. You have to make sure you get a lot green. If not, you have to use heading mode and steer the aircraft onto the final approach course until you lock onto the localizer. Once you get this distance, this distance is a good indicator. Once you get that green distance and you get your uh, indicator here, you should get a green localizer lock. Okay, and at which point the aircraft will turn towards. We also have a glide slope indicator that's starting to come down, so we're starting to work through things here. This is getting good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set our speed back to FMS. You can see it goes down to 170 knots. So I'm going to pull some power off. I'm also going to go ahead and engage approach mode because we have a glide slope armed. We have a localizer locked. So we can use the approach mode as the glide slope comes down. Once it reaches it, the aircraft will descend. We're going to go ahead and go flaps 15 once we get down to 170 knots. Let's add some power back in. This is where the aircraft definitely gets busy. The aircraft is probably the busiest at landing. You really got to watch constant battle between your flaps, between which did not come down. There they go. Between your flaps and your speed, and like it's just a constant battle. The FMS is really just there to set the program targets. Again, it works great in takeoff because it just adjusts the pitch. 
Right about 170 knots, we can go ahead and bring the gear down. It's pretty early, but we're going to bring it down anyway to stay ahead of schedule here. Watching our airspeed, because that's going to affect drag. Now you can see our target speed has now moved down to 140 knots. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that down. Takeoff power can now go to, or uh, power management can now go to takeoff. Here we're going to sit tight until we get a bit closer. Probably could have honestly left the gear down or the gear up at this point. But I've said it in just about every tutorial video that I've ever done. Give yourself time when you're learning. Don't try to fly like the pros until you're comfortable with the aircraft. You're comfortable with behavior. You've seen what it's going to do with certain actions and activities. You know, all of those things come into play. Light slope is now locked. The aircraft will begin descending on path. Which means we're going to have to pay attention to our airspeed again as we start to descend. So now in the box, I'm going to go ahead and set our missed approach altitude, which is 3,000. Watching that airspeed again. Go through our landing checklist. Landing gear is down, flaps 15, so we're still early. We're not at full flaps yet, but power management is set to take off. TLU is low speed. Icing, AOA lights as needed, exterior lights on as required. We are ready for landing. Alright, so we're just about a thousand to go, a little high. So let's go to go ahead and uh, do full flaps. You can see our target speed has now changed. Pulling power off. And I'm going to disengage the autopilot. That's yaw damper off, autopilot off. Let's get the yaw damper off. It did not turn off automatically. There we go. And throttles. Stay on glide slope here. This is probably one of the hardest aircrafts to maintain for me. Just the speed changes so dramatically. Still continuing, we're just a little low. There we go. 200 minimum. Minimum. Continuing. I throttles at idle. Oof, a little long. There it is. Props in full reverse. Looking for 60 knots. Throttles to idle. Brake set. Ooh, buddy. 
and we'll exit over to the cargo ramp. Make sure we completely vacate the runway first. We'll clear the taxiway since we have room. Alright, and let's walk through some stuff here. So most, pretty much everything is right out here in front of us. So let's just walk through it. We have the weather radar, which needs to go to off or standby in our situation. We have flight controls, gust lock. We have flaps need to be retracted. Oh, All you gotta do when this happens, just add a little bit of power, you guys. That's it. Oh, our power. There we go. We were rolling. I'm not sure how that happened. Anyway. So let's come down here and check. So radar is standby or off. Flight controls are locked. Flaps are zero. Trims are reset. We're not gonna, I'm not going to worry about resetting the takeoff trim. Um, or the elevator trim. Lights. We'll go ahead and turn the taxi light off as we're about to approach our gate. Or parking spot, I should say. Anti-ice probe heaters. TRU off. And then about two minutes after landing, although we're in simulation so we can do it now, condition lever one goes down to feather. And then fuel shut off. And yes, we taxi with only one engine. And so that's clear. And so now we'll go to the parking checklist. Engine one bleed caution. That's all normal because the engine's shutting down. So I'll release the parking brake. Let's add some power back in. We're going to take this spot right here. Good. Set the parking brake. Have the ground crew set the wheel chocks. External power if you're going to be running again. And let's go through our parking checklist. Parking brake is set. Taxi lights off. Condition lever 2 is... That actually should be condition lever 1. Oh no, condition lever 2. Yep. To feather. Beacon light gets turned off. Transponder needs to go to standby. Ah, what am I looking for? Helps if I hit the right button, huh? There we go. Transponder to standby. Tail prop. Deployed. Seatbelt signs. Off. Doors open. And now, we'll just continue the shutdown. So at this point, we're going to go up top. Main oxygen supply off. All external lights off. Oops, I forgot to turn the strobe light off earlier. My bad. Uh, let's see here. We already did that. Tap prop deployed. We can now shut down the fuel pumps. Condition lever two to shut off. OK, 
Okay, clear. Come back up top. Window heater's off. Basically, we're just doing everything that we did in reverse. Pumps off. Just working our way off. No device sign lights can come off. Emergency exit lights disarm. External power is available, but off. And finally, battery off. And ladies and gentlemen, as always, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, found it useful. If you guys are interested in acquiring the guide for the ATR, please remember to hit me up on Patreon. Uh, all subscribers, tier two and above, have access to this guide and all of my guides, as well as it just really does help out the channel. I appreciate all of you, and I'll see you guys all in the next one.